As we get to the back end of the fantasy regular season and dynasty trade deadlines loom, it's a big time for veterans who have a lot of their remaining value tied up in this current season. So as you gear up for your title run, it's important to know which win now assets are actually going to help you win now and which ones are just dead weight. My name is Paul. This is Pure Potential. If you like today's video, make sure to subscribe, like, leave a comment. Let's get into it. <laughs> So today I'll be sorting veteran players into tiers based on how much I think they're going to help you for the rest of this fantasy season. To be clear, I'm not going to be ranking these players in the exact order that I would value them in Dynasty because some players have more years remaining, more value tied up in future season than others do. So today's tiers are all about 2024 production. But as I work through this list, it's a pretty long list of veteran players, I will touch on which ones I think are maybe undervalued right now, which ones are maybe overvalued, and help you decide which veterans you might want to target in your dynasty leagues as you push into the playoffs, hopefully push for that championship. So today we're only going to be looking at players that are age 28 or older. Now I know at different positions, they age a little bit differently. So, you know, if I wanted to get real fancy, I could stagger the cutoffs at different ages depending on how the age curves work for those players i decided to just do age 28 or older and and pretty much all of the fantasy relevant players in that subset and we're going to work our way through five categories we've got at the top league winners which i'm being a little bit loose with that term i don't i don't necessarily think all of these guys are going to be league winners but these are your really really high-end scorers uh, guys that are Kind of priorities if you can get your hands on one of these players they're going to do wonders for your team down the stretch and then we have superstars which are going to be players that are still quite useful to you but maybe just a little step below in production from those league winners we have contributors players that you can certainly go after to help fill out that lineup but maybe not players you should be relying on to, to necessarily carry you to a championship and then our fourth tier is going to be desperation plays these are guys that you know, they're not necessarily dead in the water. They're not necessarily players to avoid at all costs. But for now, at least, the, it seems like a difficult path for them to be real difference makers down the stretch. And finally, we have don't bother, which is players that are, yeah, they're, they're, they're age 28 or older. They're maybe perceived as having some usefulness to your team. Um, but I would just kind of fade those guys, stay away from them. All right, so we're not really ranking these guys in order within the tiers, but the first guy I'm gonna throw in to the league winner tier is Tyree Kill. He scored 26 PPR points in week one with Tua. We've got Tua back now. I don't really have any concerns about Tyree Kill moving forward. You know, as long as we have a healthy Tua, he is going to have that type of upside that can break fantasy, right? Wide receiver two overall last year, he will continue to be the focal point of this passing game. I think he's a, a plug and play, set it and forget it type of guy the rest of the way. And then we're going to go with George Kittle. Whoops. We're going to go with George Kittle, who is really providing you with a positional advantage right now that is similar to what we saw from prime Travis Kelsey. He's scoring 18 points per game. The next closest tight end is Brock Bowers at 14. So he is just lapping the field in tight end production. And if that's not enough to sell you, I also went over to draftsharks.com and I pulled the remaining strength of schedule for every single player I'm going to talk about today. Turns out George Kittle actually has the most number one best schedule remaining for fantasy tight ends the rest of the season. And in the playoffs, he gets to play the Rams, the Dolphins, and the Lions, which I think really sets up for three high scoring games back to back to back in the fantasy playoffs. So Kittle is just an absolute smash if you can get your hands on him. The tricky part is that, you know, most of the teams that have Kittle have been winning. So he, he might not be available in your league, but if he is, where he's valued on fantasy calc, 62 overall, he's kind of in that late first range. I'm actually pretty happy to send away a late first for him. I think at age 31, he could still have several more seasons left in him, you know, based on how we've seen guys like Travis Kelsey age. Kittle is still playing at an extremely high level right now. And then rounding out this league winner tier, we've got a trio of running backs, Derek Henry, Joe Mixon, and Alvin Kamara. And these guys are just on another level right now. They are all top four running backs in points per game. They're all over 20 points per game right now. They just have incredible roles, right? Derrick Henry is just getting an absolute ton of carries. He gets those goal line carries every game. It just seems like he's a, a near lock to score a touchdown every week. He breaks off these long runs. Of, of the three of these running backs, I think he's actually playing the best. Like he still looks like an elite talent out there on the field. So, you know, he's obviously 
a great player to have on your contenders, but Kamara and Mixon are actually valued a good bit behind him on sites like Fantasy Calc, you know, like 25, 30 spots behind him, and their production is quite similar. I don't necessarily think that they are playing as well. Kamara especially, I, I, he's more of a PPR scam, but he's got the number one target share of amongst all running backs by a very, very wide margin. 20.6% is five percentage points higher than the next closest running back. So, you know, I don't really care if he's good on the ground right now. He is getting peppered with targets. He still gets the carries when they get in close. So I don't really think his production is going anywhere. And then Joe Mixon, he's kind of doing everything for the Texans. Joe Mixon actually has the third highest running back attempt percentage in the league, 67.1% of the running back rushes for the Texans. So I kind of like Mixon and Kamara a little bit more than Henry in terms of players to buy at cost because they're just, they seem a little bit less untouchable right now. And I'd say Mixon is probably my favorite buy of the three, given that he still has multiple years on his contract with the Texans. He's a couple years younger than Derrick Henry, and the Texans offense is one that should be pretty stable year over year, having CJ Stroud, Nico Collins, Tank Dell, as opposed to the Saints, which could kind of implode at any moment or arguably have already imploded. So I, I think Mixon is kind of my favorite target of these three running backs, but needless to say, you want any of these guys on your team. The tricky thing, and maybe this is just stubbornness on my part, I really struggle with sending a first round pick for any of these guys because there is a ton of fragility built in. You know, the, these are post age apex running backs. In the case of at least Kamara, possibly Mixon, we're not actually sure how much is talent driven and how much is just role driven. If one of these players was to pick up an injury, you know, we saw how far Christian McCaffrey has fallen with his injury. And we're, he's he was on another level, you know, as a player and situationally than these running backs. So there is a lot of fragility. And to send a first round pick for one of them, to have that guy go down or to just have them naturally depreciate in the offseason, that is a pretty big blow. So it's, it's a difficult balance between getting a player that can help you win right now and keeping yourself in position to to continue gaining value in the future and to keep your team in contention in the long run. So I'm trying the best I can to, you know, send a second plus a player, something like that, where I don't have to give up that first round pick. All right, moving into the superstars tier, we're going to kick it off with Christian McCaffrey, who should arguably be in the tier above. The only reason I put him here is just because we're still not entirely sure what his health status is. We don't know how quickly he's going to get ramped up for games, and we don't actually know how heavily the 49ers are gonna use him when he gets back. So the hope, you know, would be by the time we get to the playoffs, Christian McCaffrey is full go, and he's the same guy he was last year, and he's giving you 20 plus points per game easily. But exercising a little bit of caution in terms of the rest of season outlook with him, and so I've got him right here at the top of this tier. And then I'm gonna go ahead and add another 49er, Debo Samuel, who, I think is one of my favorite buys right now across the board because he's still just 28 years old right now. He's the 64th overall player over on Fantasy Calc, but I think you're looking at, you know, arguably wide receiver one upside the rest of this season. And then with the Brandon Ayuk injury, who's to say when he gets back to full strength next year? You'll have Christian McCaffrey another year older. You'll have George Kittle another year older. Debo, it just seems like a guy who's set up to, to really smash down the stretch this year carry some of that momentum into next year and remain a very useful player for you for multiple seasons. So he's a guy where you don't have to treat him like fully a win now purchase, but a win now and a win later type of guy. And then a couple more wide receivers in this tier, Cooper Cup and Terry McLaurin. Cup has been really, really good when on the field, even coming back in week eight from that ankle sprain. He had a 30% targets per out run, 1.9 yards per out run. So he certainly played second fiddle to Pukunakua, but he caught that touchdown and on a per route basis, still fairly efficient. I expect as he gets back to full strength, he's going to continue to have big games. With Cup, it's really just a matter of can he stay on the field, right? Can he string together a dozen healthy games and get you through to the end of the season? That's the question. Certainly a fragile asset, but one that can definitely help you a lot in the short term. And then Terry McLaurin has been 
really good. You know, I was kind of starting to wonder if we were ever really going to see Terry McLaurin put it together. It turns out really all he needed was that quarterback. So you look at his stats this year, he gets off to a slow start at the beginning of the year, week one, week two. He's building chemistry with a rookie quarterback, right? It's understandable. Since that time, weeks three through eight, 27% targets per out run, 3.25 yards per out run. He's had 90 receiving yards per game and he's at 18 points per game in that stretch. Typically, that's your mid to low end wide receiver one type of production. So he's just been super solid, and he's just a little bit older than Debo Samuel, just turned 29 years old. What you're hoping for is you actually have multiple seasons here with Jaden Daniels where you can continue this type of production. Now, I'm not sure how sustainable 18 points per game is with some of the big plays that he's had mixed in there, but I mean, those could still come, right? Jaden Daniels, obviously very talented. McLaurin has obviously been a guy that's been highly regarded throughout his career. So you could get multiple seasons of this type of production or close to this type of production from this McLaurin Daniels duo. And that makes me interested in buying into him at his 67 overall price tag, right? He's valued at 67 overall cup is valued at 71 overall. I would rather have McLaurin. And, and so with them being that close, he's the guy I would prefer to target out of the two and just hope that I can benefit longer from that investment. All right, next I gotta add my guy, David Njoku. I already talked about him in the video last week. His role with Jameis Winston is just awesome for fantasy. 20 points per game, 20 points per game the last two weeks with Winston playing, you know, five quarters out of those two games. So he's kind of the number one in this offense. He is going to continue to get peppered with targets and this team should throw the ball a whole lot. So it's it's just a great setup for Njoku to be one of the more impactful tight ends down the stretch. I've got him as my tight end three for the rest of the season. And then next up, you got Travis Kelsey. I would much rather have Njoku in Dynasty because he's like six years younger. I think he's gonna outscore Kelsey or at least be very, very comparable to Kelsey the rest of the way. But Kelsey is definitely not a bad guy to have moving forward. Since Rashi Rice went out in those three games, 15.6, points per game tight end uh four i believe during that stretch and that's right about where i'd expect him to be the rest of the way tight end four tight end five he's not the travis kelsey of old but he's still better than most of the guys that are being trotted out there on a weekly basis so he is a guy that that can move the needle for your team and then i kind of wavered between putting him in this tier or the next tier but i'm gonna add in aaron jones because he has been very good so far he's 14th in points per game among running backs at 16 which by the way, usually 16 points per game gets you at a higher, gets you to a higher point than just RB14. That's how good the running back position has been. But even at 29 years old, really hasn't shown any signs of slowing down, any signs of decline. And he's doing it all for the Vikings. In fact, I believe his role has actually increased over the last couple of weeks. He's been taking on a larger chunk of the work with Ty Chandler kind of falling out of favor with the coaching staff. And the big thing for Jones, 13.2% target share. That is fifth among all running backs. So I think that there's a very high weekly ceiling with Jones and he has shown to be a pretty consistent producer for us so far. All right, we're gonna try to move a little more quickly here as we get into the contributors tier. These are players that will help you, that are very, very startable, uh, that are useful. They're just not the guys that are necessarily gonna carry you to a championship, right? They are supporting players. And the first one that I wanna throw in there is Mike Evans. And similar to Christian McCaffrey, I probably would have put him up a tier if it were not for this hamstring injury because truly he has a great setup down the stretch with Chris Godwin being out for the year where he should just come back after the bye and dominate targets. It's just a little bit of caution. Like if you're gonna go out and trade for Mike Evans, I think there needs to be some built-in caution about a 30-year-old wide receiver coming back from an in-season hamstring injury. There's gonna be elevated risk of re-injury. We have no idea if it's gonna hamper his production. So I'm putting him in here as contributor, but just know that I do think he has a lot of upside if he can come back healthy later on in the year, especially with how Baker's been playing. I mean, really just surprisingly great production from him week in and week out, even with his top wide receivers out. That has been pretty impressive. Right next to Evans is going to be Devontae Adams, who I've been pretty disappointed with over the last two weeks. I mean, I guess everybody's been pretty disappointed, but I thought we could get some real fireworks with him joining Rodgers. Even as someone who's very high on Garrett Wilson, I figured Adams would come in and probably be the main guy or at least get a slight bump ahead of Wilson. But the targets have been there. The production really hasn't at all. And the separation metrics on Adams are really, really bad. And I was willing to kind of shrug that off when he was on the Raiders, you know, bad quarterback play, 
who knows what kind of system they're running. But this, I mean, this is the system right now that Adams and Rogers ran for years with great success. And so far it just hasn't been there. So I'm not saying Adams is washed, right? I'm still keeping him here in the contributors tier. I think we just have to calibrate our expectations. With the usage he's getting, he should still be like a 15, 16 points per game wide receiver. It just hasn't, it's just been bad variance so far. But I do think it's kind of a long shot for him to be a wide receiver one moving forward. All right, if you can't get your hands on Kittle, and Joku, Kelsey, Evan Ingram's gonna be the next best thing for you. He's been pretty good this year when healthy. He's had at least one monster game with Lawrence. Sometimes they just get in a certain game script and it just seems like every pass is to Evan Ingram. But now you've got Christian Kirk out for the year with this broken collarbone. We saw last year when Christian Kirk went out, Evan Ingram was the biggest beneficiary of that, which makes sense, right? They operate in similar areas of the field. So even though Kirk wasn't getting a ton of work, if most of that's going to shift over to Evan Ingram and be put on his plate, that could be a big boost for him. And I definitely think he has... He has the upside to be a top six tight end the rest of the way, but he's certainly going to be a, a locked in top 10 option moving forward. All right, then I'm going to throw in a couple more older running backs here in James Conner and Nick Chubb. These guys are just very solid. Um, I'm going to start with Conner. Conner, his target share has been down, only down, only at 8%, but he's top 10 in running back carry percentage and he's playing well. Like he, he doesn't look like he's aged. He actually seems to be playing better now really than he ever has. And so you just know he's going to get his carries every week. He's going to get those carries near the goal line. He's been a 14 points per game guy this year. That's about what I'd expect him to maintain at. So just like a super useful RB2 type to have, you can probably get him for like a late second, depending on the team you're trading with, which is pretty nice. And then Nick Chubb, he's come back. He's played two games back from that ACL, clearly still getting eased in. He hasn't been very efficient. However, he's had a very nice role. He's already at 61.4% of the running back attempts. That would be eighth best across the whole season. And he's running most of the routes as well. So he's got a full-time role already. And he's just going to get more comfortable. I think we're going to see more of the you know vintage Nick Chubb down the stretch. And the game scripts they've been in the last couple of weeks haven't really been conducive to running the ball successfully. So I think better days are ahead for Chubb. I do like him as, as a sneaky buy low. I can't take full credit for that. I saw Ryan Heath put out a tweet calling out that exact thing. But I really do like Chubb as like a budget player that you can probably go out and get because the team that has him, there's a decent chance that that team isn't doing terribly well, right? It's not like he's, you know, it's not like Nick Chubb has been helping them win games. So maybe a guy to go and look out for if you've been thin in the running back room. And then we're going to close this out with Deontay Johnson, who now is a member of the Baltimore Ravens. This one is pretty speculative, right? We don't know what the role is going to look like for the Ravens, but what we do know is that the Ravens are a terrific offense. They're very efficient. Lamar Jackson is the best quarterback that Deontay Johnson has ever played with. You know, I, I want to be optimistic about his role here. I don't think it's the best place that he could have landed, but I think we have to look at it as at least a comparable move to playing with Andy Dalton on the Panthers. You know, you can look at the target competition versus the quarterback upgrade, and maybe it's all a wash. Right now, the way that the offense is shaken out for the Ravens, you've got Flowers commanding about 25% of the targets, Bateman and Aguilar combining for 22.3%, and then you have Likely and Andrews at about 24 to 25% of those targets. My expectation is most of that's going to come from Bateman and Aguilar. Bateman's been running almost as many routes as Zay Flowers. Aguilar has been a distant third, but he has been the clear third receiver. My, in my mind, Deontay comes in, he immediately becomes that number two receiver, kind of pushes Zay Flowers for the kind of alpha role. But Flowers is always going to get his manufactured touches. He's going to get his deep stuff. So Deontay, I think, comes in and takes a lot of that intermediate work that Bateman's been having. And I think he can thrive on that, right? He's an elite separator. I think Lamar is going to really like throwing to him. I think that this hurts Andrews and Bateman and Aguilar more than it hurts Deontay. But we'll have to wait and see. That's why I've put him here in the contributors group. Oh, and I do have one more for this group, which is Jameis Winston. He's, if you look at his one game as a starter, that would put him at the quarterback two in points per game. I don't think he's going to necessarily maintain 330 passing yards and three touchdowns every week, but I do think he's going to chuck the ball a lot. And he doesn't have like an elite group of weapons, 
but between Tillman and Judy and Moore and Njoku, he seems to have enough to work with where he's just going to sling it. And some weeks he's going to throw a lot of picks and probably not be very good. But other weeks you're going to see performances like this one against the Ravens where he just goes nuts. So I think, you know, for a guy that you can probably get for a third, maybe two thirds, I think he's, he's going to have those like high end quarterback two weeks more often than not. And so that makes me kind of interested in, in picking him up. Maybe if you lost Anthony Richardson to the, to the benching, something like that, maybe you go out and you look at Jameis Winston. All right, just a few more names to get through here. Obviously not super excited about these guys, but in the desperation plays, we'll start it off with Mark Andrews. He probably would have been the next tier up if it were not for the Deontay Johnson edition, but Andrews, you know, zero games this year with a 20% target share. His routes have been coming up in recent weeks but he's still kind of living off of touchdowns. He's living off of some big plays. And weirdly with his eight out right now, his eight out of 9.5, which is pretty high for a tight end, he's kind of gonna be working the same areas of the field that you would assume Deontay is. So I do think that this kind of hurts him where the Ravens tend to use Isaiah Likely and Zay Flowers in the really close uh, short area stuff. They tend to throw it deep to Flowers more often than not. So I think that this target squeeze could hurt Andrews, who's already outside of the top 12 tight ends and points per game. So I would view him as more of a desperation play moving forward, not a guy I would be targeting to kind of fix my tight end woes. And then how about a couple of older wide receivers in Amari Cooper and DeAndre Hopkins? These guys both have been traded in season to theoretically, you know, great situations. One to Josh Allen, one to Patrick Mahomes. The problem is as good as these quarterbacks are, the offensive environments just aren't that conducive to fantasy production. Like with Cooper, you know, he got that touchdown in his first game. He was being eased in, played minimal routes. He almost doubled his routes in the second game with the Bills in week eight. He caught just one of two targets for three yards. Meanwhile, you had Keon Coleman with a big game. You had Khalil Shakir with a big game. Dalton Kincaid caught a touchdown. This offense is pretty spread out between all these players. Coleman is looking better than I expected. That's not good for Cooper. The team also has a tendency to want to run the ball, and they don't necessarily find themselves way behind a lot where they have to sling it. So I, I, I never liked this fit with Cooper and the Bills, but... It's been pretty rough so far, and I, I don't really have that much hope for it to get a lot better. Like, he's he's probably going to have a couple of big games. He'll catch a long touchdown or something, but he's really not the main guy in that offense. He's not stepping in to be the alpha. He's like a downfield guy. He's clearing out space underneath for Shakir and Kincaid. Coleman has kind of become a go-to end zone target as well, so it's hard for me to see how Cooper carves out a large role. And then with Hopkins on the Chiefs, it's hard to know what Hopkins' ability level is right now because he had that sprained MCL in the offseason. He's been on a terrible Titans offense this whole time. So it's really hard to say. I was pretty bullish on him coming into the season. Maybe he is still really good. My main issue is, number one, that the Chiefs are a super boring offense that just don't really air the ball out that much. And number two, that Hopkins' ADA in his first game with the Chiefs was 15. Now, Super small sample, but there was talk that he might be placed in that like Rishi Rice, Juju Smith-Schuster role. And even with Juju out, it doesn't really seem like they were using him that way, right? He was still being used more as a downfield guy. So if he's not going to get that, that favorable role, that Rice role, that's really the one that you want in the Chiefs offense. So I view him as like a wide receiver three with upside right now. He's kind of on the verge of like late second value, but... Not a guy I'm excited about until we see more of him on the Chiefs. Uh, and then we'll close out this tier with Russell Wilson. Mr. Unlimited himself. I'll admit, I did not think that he was going to look this good. He's had 19.8 points per game. His last two weeks, that would be QB6 on the season. I don't think that's going to maintain, which is why I've put him here. The overall pass rate for the Steelers is still quite low. He doesn't really have any weapons outside of George Pickens. So it's really, really hard for me to see this type of production continuing but I think it's pretty clear that he has earned himself the starting role moving forward. I would view him as like a mid-range QB2, and at his age and with his previous perception, he might be a guy you can get pretty cheap. So if you have a quarterback need, I think I'd rather go after him than somebody like Matt Stafford, who's probably going to cost you more and hasn't really had the production to back that up. So not the worst guy in the world to go get, but I don't think that he's necessarily a great answer at quarterback. And finally, in the don't bother tier, we've got Keenan Allen and Kareem Hunt. For Kareem Hunt, this is simply 
a timeline thing. Okay, Isaiah Pacheco is supposed to come back. You're probably only getting a few more weeks at best of this type of Kareem Hunt role. And yeah, he'll be really useful for that time frame. But what are you really paying for a few weeks of low-end RB1 production before the fantasy playoffs hit, right? By the time the playoffs hit, you're at least going to have Pacheco back in like a part-time role, which is pretty much going to kill all the upside of Kareem Hunt. So I think his whole insanity run has kind of come to an end here. He's not a guy that I'd be going after if I need a running back right now. And then Keenan Allen, he's just been downright terrible this year. He had a lot of targets in week one. He's been under a 20% targets per out run in every game since then. He's been under 1.5 yards per out run every single game this season. He's just, I don't, I don't know that he's that good anymore. And I don't know that this offense is really designed to maximize his skill set, whatever skill set that might remain. So he's really just a flex play at best. If you're playing him, you're hoping it turns into like a really negative game script where he can catch a bunch of passes and get you there on PPR value, or you're just hoping he catches a touchdown, but there's nothing differentiating him from Wandale Robinson at this point. So that's gonna do it for today, guys. I hope that that was helpful to help you kind of contextualize the rest of this season as it pertains to these veteran players. What can we expect from them down the stretch? Who's gonna really define the fantasy playoffs this year? As always, thank you guys so much for watching the video. Thank you for supporting the channel. If you enjoy my content, please consider hitting that subscribe button. It really, really goes a long way. And if you're looking for more Dynasty content from me, if you just can't get enough, you can also hit that join button underneath the video or on my channel page and become a YouTube member today. I work really, really hard on my Dynasty rankings, which I'm updating every single week right now. Every single player is assigned a trade value. I think it's a very helpful tool for constructing and completing Dynasty trades. And I also do a weekly members live stream where I answer questions about anything and everything relating to Dynasty. So, you know, basically I'm completely at your disposal as a YouTube member. So consider signing up if that's interesting to you. Either way, I'm gonna be back soon with another Dynasty video and I hope I'll see you then.